to the organisers for letting me talk here today. Um, I hope you're all having as much fun as I am. So what I'm going to talk today about, if I can just adjust this micro microphone, maybe dial it down a bit, yeah, um, is extinction in the Anthropocene and its relationship to um, the time frames that we're talking about. Okay, so I have another title, which is the original title I gave people, which is uh, Endangering Our Internal Ecosystems, uh, Human Microbiota During the Anthropocene. So the next slide is similar to the stratigraphy that you've seen already, the official stratigraphy, but it's kind of cartoony. I like this a lot more. Well, no, well, that's, that's wrong. I don't really like it a lot more. Um, but boundaries of periods and epochs, as you've heard, are kind of set by um, chemical signals, golden spikes that you can see in depositional layers. But I am zoocentric because I'm a biologist, and so to me what these layers represent is extinctions of organisms. And, you know, the two big ones we've already heard about, the extinction of the dinosaurs, the great Permian extinctions, and it occurred to me that maybe we could think about the controversy about dating the start of the Anthropocene by looking at uh, organisms. And um, we've got three main contenders, I guess, plus the Paleoanthropocene off towards the left there, the beginning of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, and the Great Acceleration. And we can think about the kinds of extinctions that might have occurred in each of those. We've just heard about the megafaunal extinctions and the strong connection between human spread around the planet and the disappearance of the megafauna. Probably by hunting, these are very slow reproducing large animals. They're, you know, they're kind of dumb if they haven't seen predators like humans before. They're easy to kill. Uh, they provide a lot of meat. So they roughly span the, the uh, paleo and early agricultural. Then we've got the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Exploration, where we have a whole series of overhunting. In particular, we also have an introduction of invasive species. Um, I just love the look of this dodo here. He's just looking at that ship going, oh, the neighbourhood's just gone completely to hell. Um, <laughs> he can see his extinction. <laughs> staring him in the face. Um, and then we've got um, the modern era. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of these organisms. Uh, maybe you've heard of Lonesome George, the last uh, of this particular species of tortoise, you know, the last one. Uh, but here's a whole bunch of other things as well. You know, monk seals, crescent nail-tailed wallabies, clouded leopards, bernards, wolf, Caspian tiger. They've all gone extinct very, very recently um, since the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Now, one thing um, that you might notice here is um, the embiggening of the Anthropocene, to use a popular culture reference. Um, in fact, most of the things on, this, on the planet are smaller than a matchbox, and most of them are much, much smaller than a matchbox. All the pictures that you can see there are, are of what we call charismatic large animals. And we actually need to be much more concerned about the extinction of other, much smaller things. For instance, if pollinators went extinct tomorrow, we'd all be dead within about two months. So, and these are not things that we think about usually. So, we do know about some extinctions of invertebrates and microorganisms, but not very many. So what I began to think about was um, the potential to examine extinctions by looking inside ourselves. There's been a theme running through this conference about humanity as being distinct from nature. This is one of the reasons why we are nature, because we are an ecosystem and we have huge numbers of organisms. We are not one species. We are many thousands of species. If you count up all the species that live in our mouths, that live in our gut, that live on our skin. And we can examine the human gastrointestinal tract, our conjunctiva, urinary, urinary tract, vagina. All of these are colonised by complex ecosystems of microorganisms. So let's think about this. And I, I don't know how many of you know this, but every adult, 
has 10 to the 14 cells. That's a one followed by 14 zeros. But we have 10 to the 15 bacterial cells that live in a synonymous. In other words, that's 10 times the number of cells. In terms of information, humans have about 22,000 genes, but there are actually hundreds of times that many genes in the microbiota. So any way you cut it in terms of living cells or in terms of DNA information, the humanness of us is vastly overwhelmed by the mi microbialness of us. And this is called the human microbiota, and the collection of genes is called the microbiome. This microbiota is diverse. This is just kind of a family tree of the kinds of things that live in us and on us. You don't need the detail. You just, every single end of those branch points is a different species or genus of organism that lives in us. As I mentioned before, the genes in these things that live in us and on us vastly outnumber the human genes that we have. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a really nice illustration of the kind that was shown uh, from National Geographic, you know, just to give you a sense of how big this resource is. Now, this human microbiota differs according to where you look on the uh, body, so every single body is like, uh, part of the body is like a different ecosystem. Uh, Mary Marples, in a famous poem in the Scientific American, talked about the cool woods of our scalp or the, um, the tropical forest of armpit and crotch. Um, you know, but it's, it's actually true. There's a whole bunch of ecosystems. Possibly the easiest ecosystem to examine is the digestive system, because there's huge numbers of microorganisms. So what I started thinking about was the evolution of this digestive system in relationship against the background of the Anthropocene. So this microbiota has co-evolved with us. It's meant to be there. But there's a bunch of things, uh, chiefly cultural practices, that are likely to have changed this population, changed the assemblage, changed its composition. And here's a list, fire, agriculture, heavy metals, diet, birthing, sanitation, antibiotics, transport and dispersal. And I'm gonna run through these one by one because in many ways this story matches up with the dates of the Anthropocene, the proposed dates of the Anthropocene much more clearly than the megafaunal extinctions. So we can ask, what was the ancestral microbiota like? What were the original hunter-gatherers? What did they have in their gut? And we can use three different ways. We can compare ourselves with the other great apes. We can examine, examine fossil microbiota. Um, for those of you who don't know, this lovingly preserved museum specimen here is actually a fossil human shit. It's called a coprolite. That's another one there. Uh, you can actually get DNA out of those and ask questions about uh, what organisms are there. Um, or you can examine uh, tartar. This is calculus on teeth. This fossilizes uh, bacteria as well. Or you could examine the microbiota of current day hunter-gatherers. So all of those stories tell basically exactly the same conclusion. First up, microbiota in the great apes. This is a family tree, not of the great apes themselves, but of the microbiota within the great apes. And what you can see from here is that the distinction between humans and the other great apes, or the chimps, I should say, is back at 7 to 13 million years. Now, that's some 2 to 8 million years earlier than we know the, the DNA of the human and chimpanzee diverges. So in other words, the microbiota of humans has, given, has, has evolved much more rapidly than that of the great apes. There are also, there's also evidence that it's lost ancestral diversity. If we look at the diversity of bacteria in the gut of great apes, we see that it's much higher than in the gut of humans. And if we look at different human populations, we find a decline in diversity uh, corresponding with a degree of urbanization. So subsistence farmers, agriculturalists, and modern US populations, you see this decline in the number of organisms. One of the interesting things is uh, a, a fairly old hypothesis called the expensive tissue hypothesis. For our size, we have a much bigger brain than we should have, and a much smaller gut 
one of the reasons or one of the reasons uh, suggested for why this should be the case is our use of fire. And you just heard about fire in the last, um, the last talk. We now know that fire goes back to about 350,000 years ago, willful use of fire and control of fire, and that using fire to prepare food increases the calories you can, you can obtain from the same amount of food. That allows you to put more resources into your brain instead of your gut. Your gut shrinks, your brain gets bigger, and modern humans evolve. I mean, that's a very simplified version. I'm looking over at Greg and he's going, mm, uh, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, but he can, he can correct me later. <laughs> um, so here's one reason why we have less diversity. We has, have less room. You know, a smaller ecosystem, smaller organism, a smaller number of organisms. Then we come to agriculture. Now, this is some work done in South Australia at the Centre for Ancient uh, DNA, where what they've done is they've actually looked at microorganisms fossilised on human skeletons, and they've characterised, and pretty broadly, these are, these are big taxonomic groups, it's not species or genera or anything like that, but you can see clear changes from hunter-gatherer into Neolithic, into Bronze Age, and there's a, there's a serious change with the origins of agriculture, and there's a serious change around the same time as the Industrial Revolution with the uh, increased availability of processed food. And generally, it's a general thing that, that you get the appearance of more and more pathogenic species, things that are not good for us. Now, finally, um, you can examine present-day hunter-gatherers. So these are the uh, Yanomomai. They've probably been in isolation or were in isolation for about 11,000 years. They have the highest gut microbial diversity and gut gene diversity of any known human population. This is, this is what's called an accumulation curve. You just have to pay attention to this. There's lots here. There's less in subsistence farmers, and there's still less in modern US populations. So in other words, the trajectory of human urbanization and civilization has gone hand in hand with a decline in diversity of microbi our microbial um, friends, if you like. Here's another study from, um, from Papua New Guinea, comparing two Papua New Guinea tribes with modern US. And the point I want to make here is that there are a whole series of organisms that are present in some cases in every single individual in a Papua New Guinea um, hunter-gatherer subsistence society that are extinct in modern, human po modern civilized populations. They're just not there at all. The only things that are present in the US population that are not present in the Papua New Guinea populations are things like Pseudomonas and Clostridium, which are pathogenic and are not good for us. So how do we get this microbiota? Where do we get it from? Well, in the uterus, we're essentially sterile, and we get our first microbiota when we're born. But how we're born makes a big difference. So the, um, the red dots here, this is the vaginal microbiota, and the pink dots are the microbiota in newborns that had vaginal delivery. You can see it's similar to the microbiota of the vagina. In other words, you know, the kind of thing, system we've got here is that birth inoculates newborns. On the other hand, if you deliver by caesarean, the microbiota of newborns is essentially the same as the mother's skin. That's the oral microbiota for comparison. Uh, the relevance of all of these things will become much more apparent later. Breastfeeding. Here's another way that we get microbiota. Now, we can't do these experiments with humans. It's unethical. Um, but you can do them with monkeys, which some would argue is unethical as well, but, you know, I'm just presenting the results. Um, so if you breastfeed monkeys, they have much more diversity and they have a different kind of immune cells dominate the intestinal system. Whereas if you breastfeed, or if you, if you uh, formula feed monkeys, you have much more of the clostridium, for instance, and uh, less helpful immune cells, less helpful compounds flowing around in that 
in that uh, system. Next, all of us protect our health by using antimicrobial compounds. Uh, but those antimicrobial compounds, they're designed to kill um, the diseases that we have, the bacterial diseases, but there's a lot of collateral damage. So every time we take antibiotics, there's a huge decline in microbial diversity. So the diversity just crashes. Now it does recover, but it never recovers fully. And the organisms that recover often contain new genes for resistance to the agents that you've just used, and the diversity of those organisms that recover is much, much less than the original diversity that was present. So why should we care about this? Well, it's becoming more and more obvious that our microbiota is part of us as an organism. And it's important for educating the immune system. It has roles in metabolism. It protects us against pathogens. So let's just have a look at some of these things that can go wrong. I've already mentioned some of them. Sometimes it's actually your host genetics because, you know, you have an interaction with these organisms. Uh, sometimes it's lifestyle, diet, stress. Sometimes it's colonisation. And sometimes it's medical practices. Or, commonly, it's a mixture of all four. And those things lead to what is called dysbiosis, meaning, you know, an unbalanced microbial ecosystem. And that leads to various disease outcomes, some of which I'm going to talk about now. The first of these, strangely, is obesity. So this is a, an interesting story of people were trying to figure out genes for obesity and they bred lines of m mice to be obese or not obese. They couldn't find any genetic signal for an obesity gene, because, you know, that's what pharma wants. They want an obesity gene. We can find that, we can fix it, and that, that's going to make us a bunch of money. Then someone did a really interesting experiment. They got these two mouse lines, and they delivered the babies aseptically, so they were germ-free, and then they transplanted the microbiota between the fat mouse line and the skinny mouse line, and guess what? If you take the microbiota from this mouse put it in that mouse, this one gets fat, and vice versa. So that also happens in humans. We've got these complex interactions in our epithelial cells where, of, the, of the gut lining where micro, microbiota talk to the biochemistry of the human cells. And they lead to all sorts of interesting interactions with the liver, with fatty tissue, with the hypothalamus, with muscles, mainly to do with decreasing our sensitivity to insulin. Uh, and we all know about decreased, decreased sensitivity to insulin. That's basically diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And you'll notice that all of these things talk about inflammation. We know also that the microbiota is protecting us against pathogens. And again, these feedbacks are only just starting to be uh, teased apart. They're extremely complex, biochemical, uh, immunological, and signaling feedbacks between the microbes that live in us and on us, which after all are protecting their turf, don't forget. You know, they live there already. They don't want any other microorganisms to come and set up shop. Then there are a whole series of complex diseases of modern society that have exhibited enormous increases in frequency since the 1950s that are very difficult to explain, that don't seem to have single causes that present differently, um, and it's beginning to look like many of these diseases are actually microbial in origin, and they're due to perturbation of our internal ecosystems. Irritable bowel syndrome is one. Um, unstable gut microbiota, you get chronic gut dysfunction, you get feedbacks to the inflammatory pathways of the immune response. We don't understand the entire mechanisms of this, but it's looking as though this is the cause. And there's a whole bunch of other complex diseases as well. I'm not going to go into the evidence for each of these. Uh, probably some of these will be struck off the list in time, but the list is interesting in itself. Psoriasis, esophagitis, obesity, childhood onset, and asthma, IBS, functional bowel disease, colorectal carcinoma, even cardiovascular diseases. 
Now, finally, there's some really interesting stuff appearing now. Most of you might know that the frequencies of both anxiety and depression um, are increasing rapidly in modern society. It turns out from um, observation, we have always known that uh, gut diseases that we now suspect are caused by microbiota, irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's, Crohn's and things like that, are strongly comorbid with anxiety and depression. In other words, if, if you live in a family where someone has IBS, you're much more at risk of anxiety and depression. And this kind of told us that there's this crosstalk between the brain and the microbiota that live inside us. We now are beginning to tease apart what this actually means. And there are all sorts of, um, all sorts of crosstalk signals, neurotransmitters, talking between the um, enteric microbiota, the gut microbiota, which produce these short chain fatty acids that interact with the nerve cells in the, in the gut and feed back to the brain via the vagus nerve. And all of this is um, complex, not fully understood, but we do know from mouse models where you can manipulate the gut contents of mice and you can look at the behaviour of mice, that you can ramp up anxious type behaviours in mice and how well that translates to human behaviour, I don't know. But we can't actually do this with, you know, if we could get some twins and kind of, <laughs> but we're not allowed to, right? So we can only use mice. Anyway, there's a strong association between the type of microorganisms you have in your gut and your uh, propensity for anxiety and depression. Okay, so all of this is called dysbiosis. And these alterations are strongly associated with complex diseases. Frequency is increasing in the developed world. But the story I've just told you about alterations to our gut microbiota strongly conforms to the time periods that have been suggested as, as start points for the Anthropocene. So, the invention of agriculture and the change in our diet, the Industrial Revolution and the increase in um, processed food uh, and early exposure to agents like mercury and arsenic, and from the 1950s onwards, the Great Acceleration. What do I mean by this? Well, shift to agricultural diet corresponds here absolutely. Oh, by the way, the, the early use of fire corresponds essentially to the beginning of the human species, or in the beginning of, maybe of the, paleo, the early Paleoanthropocene. The Industrial Revolution, processed food, mercury, arsenic, and from the 1950s onwards, the things that really change our microbiota and change it for the worse are these things. Caesarean birth, bottle feeding, sanitation, the use of antibiotics and disinfectants, and transport and dispersal. So, the challenge is to understand these microbial ecosystems, and so far, we haven't had much luck with therapies. There's one exception. It's called C. diff or Clostridium difficile. It's a nasty um, diarrheal disease that breaks down the intestinal lining. It's basically often, often happens after antibiotic therapy. Everything else is gone. This organism comes in and takes over. It's like an invasive species, like the cane toad of the human gut. There is a solution for this. And it's very similar to bush regeneration. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, it's a poo sandwich from a donor who has a good microbiota. It's extraordinarily successful. All you do is replace, well, you don't actually eat a sandwich. I just, <laughs> I just said that for effect. It's actually a milkshake, and, but they don't swallow it. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, so this, is, this is, you know, we don't understand the system, but we understand enough to know that its complexity can be restored by using a previously complex system. Okay, so microbial conservation. You know, there are a whole bunch of things that are extinct in civilised, modern... Well, I won't say civilised, because we're not very, are we? Um, but, you know, modern urbanised society. That means that people like this, the Yanomomai, may well become, in addition to custodians of knowledge, custodians of important ex organisms that are otherwise extinct in us. So I just thought I'd finish off with how's the rest of the microbial world going? <laughs> 
pretty well, thank you very much. Um, humans, we affect microbial distribution, both purposely and accidentally. Here's an example of accidental. There are 3.8 by 10 to the 4 microbial cells inside sheep and cattle that otherwise wouldn't be on the planet. The consequences of that, these produce methane. So, you know, microbial activity here, we need to keep an eye on this microbial abundance and activity because it's a component of an important part of the Anthropocene changes. We're also major factors in dispersal of microorganisms. I love this figure. This is a figure of the plane flight from Hong Kong to Beijing carrying the SARS index case, and these boxes around are the people that got infected, in case you're ever worried about you know, traveling next to someone sneezing on a plane. Um, and, of course, we transport all sorts of stuff around the world. One of the biggest sources is this. Uh, we suck up ballast water, transport it around the world, and pump it out somewhere else. And it's not just, you know, we, we've thought about invasive starfish, and you saw zebra mussels the other day. They, tra they transplant it this way, but we just don't think about microorganisms at all. Too hard. Uh, we do know that cholera and uh, toxic dinoflagellates um, have been transported this way. You're about to hear this. Microorganisms from about somewhere around 2.7, 2.8 billion years ago have fixed most of the nitrogen on the planet that is available for human consumption or for animal or plant consumption. And that's balanced. You know, there's fixing of nitrogen and there's microorganisms that denitrify and convert that back into nitrogen gas. We have completely sidestepped this process through a combination of industrial fixation through the Haber-Bosch process, legume cultivation, and also burning of fossil fuels. We are now responsible for doubling this um, nitrogen fixing flow. We are also going to be responsible for worldwide selection events. You've heard about ocean acidification and about uh, global temperature changes. Of course, any time you change pH or temperature, you select for organisms that do better under lower pHs and higher temperatures. Microorganisms will cope with that just fine because they have generation times and population numbers that are going to be unaffected by these. And finally, we can now make completely artificial microorganisms. The first artificial microorganism was announced in 2010. We can DNA sequence the um, entire organisms, store those sequences digitally, transmit them to anywhere on the planet, stick them into a DNA synthesizer, and potentially at least resynthesize those at a later date stick it all together, shove it back in a cell. So this is going to allow us also to uh, construct synthetic organisms. And this kind of um, illustrates the problem with humans. I mean, this, this power over the DNA coding of life is both an opportunity and a threat. My kind of um, stance as a biologist and being, as I said, you know, um, zoocentric. For this reason, I, I actually think that the, that the Anthropocene should begin in 1953, because that's when we discovered the structure of DNA. I know that's not going to go down stratigraphically, but, you know, I think, I think this is... And, and the, the other thing about a late start for the Anthropocene is it allows us to think about possibilities rather than inevitabilities. We're at the start of a new age, not the end of an era. And, uh, oh yeah, there's uh, just some summaries there. There's a bunch of things we've done, a bunch of ads. Um, and uh, thank you, I'll take questions in the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>